But I did not include in here $33 million that it costs to fund the Snake River Compensation Plan. And so I'm saying general costs and includes like you know the work they're doing now. Uh, I mean the kind of work they're doing happen to be at Bonneville, but you know when they're doing that on the snake, I mean things break and you have to put in a new lock and so forth. And so you know some of that money. And then there's about three million uh, of general fish su uh, support uh, going in. And then and all that comes out to about twenty-five thousand large. If we add the Lower Snake River plan, compensation plan, uh, that boost, that's alone is 30 to 33 million. So if we included that and it's a cost of operating the Lower Snake River dams, then we're talking about well over 25,000. And that's all taxpayer money. There's no, um, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, some shipping is comes out of, or some operations of the dams comes out of hydropower, in fact 90% comes out of hydropower. And so, uh, but I just want you to think about when you see these barges, you, you know, you and your fellow federal taxpayers are paying about 25000 minimum. So we'll switch now to hydropower. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how do proponents of reaching the dams sit down at the table with the farmers? Because I'm a proponent of reaching, but I don't want the farmers to lose their livelihood. How do we sit down with them and, talk, and dialogue and say, can we take some of the subsidy and put it toward change, you know, putting a pipeline so that the water gets up to your crops? How do we do that? Because right now it just seems we're polarized. Yes, and I think, and here's my take. The farming community and uh, irrigators and so forth, um, you know, they're not the bad guys, you know, no. big bad gal. They're just out there trying to make feed their family. Um, and so, but right now, I mean, the last major battle of the Snake River was kind of over the dams, was in 2002. Some of you probably remember that. It was when the uh, Corps did their uh, juvenile uh, survival study. And there were four options that they considered making no change, doing more transportation of people's, uh, yearlings, fish uh, by barge. Um, I always wonder if they count that in barge. I guess they do. And then, uh, or fix the dams or breach. We've done all the other first three. And by fixing the dams, they've spent over $800 million. Um, but as we'll see soon, it's not working very well. So I think, I think farmers have to recognize that they have to get to the table and talk. Until they do, and as long as they think they're going to win this, then um, no, that won't happen. And the salmon people, I think, you know, whatever, the salmon and orca folks, they, um, this is a last ditch stand for them. I mean, if the, sand, if the dams, all kinds of scientists say if the dams aren't removed, um, the fish are going to be gone. Especially if you run steelhead, sockeye, uh, you know, some of those. So, okay, let's, let's uh, that answer the question. Mm -hmm. So, now we're going to talk about uh, hydropower. And this is a, a graph that shows the hydropower situation in the Northwest. You know, all, all of it. And so to meet uh, required load, in other words, the demand that we have, takes, by this uh, graph, takes about 83% of the uh, resources that we have. Here it could be, if we took out the Snake River dams, then that's, you're going to lose 3%. And here's our surplus, even after the dams were gone. Now, one interesting thing about this is this is the situation in a extremely low water year. It's they call it the 1970, uh, 1937 critical water. So in other words, if we went as low as we have and went since keeping records um, with our water, because that's you know predicts how much energy can be uh, had, so to speak. 
then those are the results. Now, if you go to a um, average year, which seems to me would be, you know, if you look at that, and then this goes to 21%. This stays about three, and this is then uh, 24 in spot. Anyway, I just want you to see that if we took out the dams, we'd still have plenty of power to, so satellites could still make coffee. That's what we've got to say for you. Okay. Um, one of our, we just have this great surplus of power coming on the market. And there's a big change going on in the power market. And so this, for example, the Northwest Power Council uh, has their, they have plan that we're portfolio and how much uh, they're going to uh, need in power and whatnot. Well, we're saving a lot of power through efficiency. Um, Morgan and I bought some new bulbs <coughs> last week and, you know, they're more efficient than the ones we had up there. Uh, and, you know, we bought a, uh, what we installed a uh, uh, new air conditioner and way more efficient than the 20-year-old one. So when we consider all that kind of uh, efficiency savings, by 2020, which is not very far away, uh, they say just through energy savings, we'll save 1,000 megawatts. Okay? All four Laura Snake River dams average about 963 uh, over the last 17 years. So, so you know, it gives you an idea. So just in savings by, by uh, 2020, uh, we are, uh, have on our hands uh, the power of all four snake river dams. Now by 2030, look at there, they're saying by 2030, savings alone will be 4,000 megawatts of energy. And that is the equivalent of 16 lower snake river dams. Here's where you, you really see some change going on. Oh, that's good stuff. I, I, uh, I do a, a med every night, and, and I'm, I guess it'd be fair to say I'm on the pill. <laughs> anyway, Lord um, reminds me she's not taking your pill. <laughs> I could think, well, gee, I wonder, it seems like I was turned around at some point. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, electricity um, used to sell, well, I'll back up. All the power that is produced by the lower Snake River dams could be considered as surplus power. <clears throat> the uh, Bonneville Power create, uh, markets, I mean, they, they market from 31 dams. And a, high, and a nuclear plant and, and some other sources. And so um, they used to sell that as surplus power uh, for about $60 a megawatt hour. So here we are about, you know, roughly through there. Things started to change in 2009. And there was so much power coming on the market that um, prices fell for surplus power. And they went to, now, currently, they're about $22. That's on average. I mean, sometimes they can sell power for 100 and sometimes they sell it for as low as minus 19. That is, they pay somebody $19 a megawatt hour to take this power off their hands. They can't turn the dams off without increasing spill. I mean, this, is, of course, happens in the spring. And so first they shut down wind, and they shut down solar, and then they throttle back the nuclear plant, and they, they have to pay for that uh, to wind producers and solar producers. And then uh, they still have excess power, and so they have to get rid of it because, you know, they can't, they have to keep uh, a moderate amount of spill going over or they get nitrogen gas and kill fish. So it's kind of a, you know, unique relationship there. So anyway, now, it's about $22 on average. And um, in terms of the Lower Snake River dams, when it was at 60, that produced revenue for them of 
of about 503 million. Today, that same amount of energy would be sold for 186 million. So over 300 million difference in production from those dams. And that's created a real bind for uh, Bonneville. So what did Bonneville do? Well, at first, they said, gosh, we don't want to raise prices, so we're going to cap our reserves. We've got a pretty healthy reserve, $917 million. And that was in uh, 2007. And then the reserves started going down and down and down and down. A little blip here, because they raised prices off the dock. And in 2017, they had $5 million in reserves. And they need 300 million to have six weeks of operating capital. So they decided that uh, they had to do something, and they were going to add on to the costs each year 20 billion, 20 million, and, and build that reserve account back up. And uh, of course, that would take 15 years, and they don't have 15 years. So, but. Just recently, in 2019, uh, over here, they discovered that um, they had been, uh, in their accounting system, they have power and transmission kind of operating as two separate businesses. And so they just found this error uh, in their uh, transmission side of the budget and said, gosh, some of this money really belongs with our power side. And so they're in the process now of transferring that money over to their reserve account. And guess what? It's 300 million. <laughs> so I, I mean, I'm not an accountant, so it just seems so curious to me. But, uh, so now they're, you know, theoretically, I think they're back to about 200 million about here. So now here's what they did with their prices. First, they were subsidizing these prices. And then they said, we got to start raising prices. And so they, their prices are set for two years, and so currently they're $35.57. You might want to remember, just remember $35. Um, and so that's how they address the, that problem, and it, the problem is continuing to grow. <coughs> One of the problems is what's happened with the cost of wind. And here you can see uh, in 2010, wind cost to produce $87.50, no problem for Bonneville or Solar, or, I mean, you know, other companies are, because uh, that was a pretty high price. But today, in fact, that was $217, it's $33. It's, it's dropped 62% in price, and all indications are it will continue to drop. Uh, one of the interesting things going on is, as coal plants are shut down, uh, people are there where they, those plants were are building wind and solar. And that's because all the transmission lines are there. You know, over in Kittitas County, for example, where uh, Kaiser Aluminum was, and they you know, and ended their contract with uh, Bonneville Power. It cost them $75 million to end it, so you know they, they want it out. And uh, so anyway, now they're putting in a big solar farm because they have the transmission. Um, in wind, Montana uh, said, we have wonderful resources to produce a lot of wind energy. And now we're going to have transmission capabilities because uh, <coughs> the two, uh, Coal Strip 1 and Coal Strip 2, our co coal plants are both closing. And they're closing ahead of time. And it's because they cannot produce with coal any more power that's marketable. 